Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Freedom. Every week I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And if you've ever wanted to know how solving problems with effective sales skills can help you to create legacy through real estate investing, then guess what? This is the conversation that you're going to want to listen to until the very last word. You know why? Because today's guest, apart from being awesome, is a growth-minded sales leader with a talent for building high-performance teams. He's also the vice president of a very large real estate services firm that most of us will know. And if he wants to tell us a little bit about that, he can. Uh, Also, he has a very in-depth knowledge of the Columbus, Ohio and Central Ohio markets. He is an investor. And also, he has titles that he absolutely loves, which is husband and father. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, Mr. Matthew Drain. Matthew, welcome to the show, man. Billy, it's great to be here. Thank you. And you know, I just, I'm, I'm all excited. I'm just like, when I see your face, I see your smile. I know all the positive <laughs> things that you're doing in life. It's going to be an amazing conversation. And also, this is one of the things, like whenever somebody's from Ohio, I always have to start out this way. So here we go. OH. I O. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you, you, you know, that intro was great. I had to make sure I was in the right place. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know if you're talking about me or somebody else. <laughs> you got it, man. You got it. You got it. Well, listen, man. So, Matthew, you know, I love uh, having a great conversation with you. And at the same time, I love to ask everybody the same five questions. Right. And so I'd love for you to get us started to help us understand where exactly do you live in the U.S.? Sure. So uh, I am now back in my home state of Ohio. I live in Columbus, Ohio, the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. And I moved here about a year ago. I was in D.C., our nation's capital, for 15 years. So it's good to be back home. All right. Very nice. Very nice. And uh, as I think most people know, but uh, this guy, Billy Keels, was also born in Columbus, Ohio. So it's uh, got a special place for Columbus in my heart. So so, uh, right. so so glad that you're here. And Matthew, Talk to us about the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours. You know what? That's the easy one. Um, A good friend of mine, a very close friend, Justin Bibb, uh, he actually is running for mayor in the city of Cleveland. Uh, Spent a couple of hours uh, there to celebrate his birthday. And we went to a phenomenal restaurant, had a great dinner and um, just really enjoyed being around some friends for a few hours. So uh, that was it. Oh, man. Got to love that whenever you get time to catch up uh, with family, with friends and just enjoy those nice little moments is uh, is fantastic. So listen, man, it's time to jump into the conversation. Now, I talked about Let's a couple it. things at a very high level, Matthew, and um, I would love for you to share with the entire Going Long family more about your backstory, some of the major decisions that you made to get to this point in your journey. And then from there, you and I will kind of take the conversation moving forward. But uh, tell us, give us a better uh, understanding of who is Matthew Drain, please. Sure. So uh, I'm a father. I'm a husband. Uh, my wife and I have been together 12 years and we are a Miami merger. So we met in college. Uh, so college sweethearts. Um, my backstory, uh, I'll start with real estate. My father was always involved in real estate. Uh, he currently has a construction company in Cincinnati. But growing up, I used to travel to his properties. He had a few duplexes, a few four units. And I bought my first property in 2005. Uh, I caught the bug quickly. And uh, about that same time in 2007, I had an opportunity to go to Baghdad of all places. And um, being able to travel, and you'll appreciate this, uh, see more of the world and more of the opportunity that the world presents. uh, That's when I realized I had to find a way to earn uh, money so that I can do the things that I enjoy doing, which quite frankly, is traveling and having experiences for me and my family. Um, So recently, uh, I should say in the last nine years, I've dedicated my my energy and my time to being a full-time commercial real estate broker. uh, And I help clients solve problems. Uh, I've solved a lot of problems and I've sold over $400 million in transactions doing so. Uh, So that's my full-time career. That's my current place in real estate. 
And you can't be around this business without investing. So along the way, I've learned a lot. Man, that's fantastic. And so to be able to have that type of a, um, a, a of a role model at home to be able to see through your father's construction company and then being able to also get involved early on um, through investing, I think is is fantastic. But you said something about that. I just I want to kind of pick up because I want to sure. figure out where this goes. And I, and I heard like because me being a salesperson as well, like I'm thinking 400 million in transactions. That sounds phenomenal. Uh, you know, you got started back in 2005. But you said in 2007. You were in Baghdad and then you just kind of kept going. <laughs> we, we, yeah. Oh, bring that one back, man. So, t- so tell us a little bit about wh- how did Baghdad get into your travel plans back in 2007? I was working for a organization called the Gallup Organization. So the Gallup Poll, uh, a global consulting and research firm. And we won a big contract in Baghdad. And I was 24 at the time. And I raised my hand, went down to the CEO's office and said, congratulations, uh, fantastic news. And I volunteered to go. Uh, little did I know, I was the only person foolish enough to volunteer to go to a war zone. Uh, but two weeks later, I was in Kuwait uh, with a duffel bag and I was there for nine months, uh, embedded in Baghdad in the middle of the surge. Um, that's how I got there. It was a great, great opportunity. And to tie it together to how I ended up um, converting that into a real estate career, I wanted to learn how to broker. Brokerage is typically 100% commission. That opportunity did two things for me. It opened my eyes up to the world because it now gave me an experience that I couldn't unsee, which is traveling globally. And it also, it paid pretty well. So that was the start of my, my financing that will allow me to go those 9, 12, 18 months of learning commercial brokerage without earning an income. So that was the bridge uh, from a job to my passion and to my dream. Man, that's fantastic. And so I don't know too many people that would have um, consciously put their hand up to go uh, into a, into a war zone uh, at the time, of course. And um, yeah, so I think that's great. And, and being able to do that at 24. Now, had you already traveled outside the United States before that? Canada and, um, and Mexico. So your typical, you know, American, you know, uh, I'm now traveled, uh, destinations, Cancun and, uh, Toronto. <laughs> right, hey, well, hey, there you go, man. This is, look, at least you, you're, you're moving and traveling. So, um, sure. so, so that's great, man. So, so there's a number of things that I, I'd love for us to be able to unpack. Um, and so you, you talked about also to problem solving, and, right. and this is one of the things that I highlighted about you uh, in the beginning and, and, and me being a sales professional, we have loads of sales professionals that listen to us, right? Because it's awesome. just the people that, um, that, that we tend to listen to us, right? And right. so I'm a big lover of the sales profession because I believe that we do solve problems. Exactly what you talked about. I think it's the most noble profession in the world when done properly. Um, but help us understand what really has attracted you to this desire to solve problems for others? Sure. I mean, so part of it was selfish in the very beginning. I wanted to learn how to broker apartment buildings because I wanted to eventually buy own uh, apartment buildings myself. So what better way to learn what great owners and operators do well and what they do poorly than to underwrite, you know, 50 apartment deals a year at a minimum. Uh, So I've seen a lot of income statements. I've seen a lot of rent rolls. I've seen what's done well and what's not done well. So part of it started out selfishly. um, And then it just becomes, you know, somewhat of a, I, I guess, a challenge, a thrill. How can I insert myself into a situation where this owner has been unable to figure out this problem on their own And if I can do so and help them, then obviously I'm handsomely rewarded. That's the give, that's the win-win scenario that I'm always seeking. How can I help someone achieve their goals and in turn earn an income that I can then use as I see fit to pursue my own personal passions and my own legacy? That's the beautiful place to be in life when you wake up every day with a plan of how how do I help someone knowing that on the back end I'll be taken care of. Yeah. And it it makes me think of, I think it's Zig Ziglar that has the quote, you know, you can get everything in life that you want as long as you help enough people get what they want out of life. And ultimately that is what, what the solving problems really comes down to. Um, and maybe a lot of people are not really familiar with the the type of client, right? Cause whenever, whenever I think of, of a, of a, um, of a broker, especially in the commercial real estate space, specifically residential, you kind of have two, two customers, right? You have the customer who is looking to 
exit a, a property. And then you have people that are potentially scanning the marketplace to find that right property. And then in the middle is the broker. And so a lot of times, and I really want to draw on your expertise here because maybe someone who is looking to get started to buy their first, I don't know, 150, 200 unit apartment complex, they don't really know, how, maybe they're in a high paid job right now and they're thinking about transitioning or something like that. And they don't really know how to build a strong relationship with a qualified broker. Maybe right. talk to us a little bit about what you've seen are some of the best ways to really create a truly long lasting relationship with a with a broker like yourself. Sure. So so that unit count that you mentioned, you know, I'll even go a little bit smaller, 50 to say 200 units. That's the perfect deal size for someone who is entering into this business. And quite frankly, my entire career has been in what I call the private client niche of the marketplace. So deals between 1 million to say $15 million in price point. So we're not talking about the class A trophy garden style deal that's $30 million in the suburbs. We're talking about the 1970s uh, vintage C product that looks a little rough on the outside, might have a few issues in the neighborhood. Um, those type of deals, that's where I live. And I am not afraid and I'm willing to speak to anyone that wants to learn about the markets that I serve. Um, so it starts with a phone call. If you already own a building of that size, a good broker, I'm calling you. Um, I'm calling you uh, every single uh, month, at least to check in on your business plan to see how I can be of value and add service uh, to you. And I think it goes both ways. If you want to build a relationship, don't be afraid to reach out. If you don't own in my market, give me a ring. If you'd like to learn more about our market, give me a call. And I'll be willing to share anything in terms of the data, what we're seeing, the market trends. Um, but that's where it starts. It starts with relationship. Now, once you have a relationship, how do you build credibility? Well, as a buyer, you build credibility by doing what you'll say, what you say you'll do. It's no different than me as a salesperson. Uh, if I say I'm going to call you at this time, if I say I'm going to deliver something to you uh, by email on this day, I have to honor that promise and keep that promise. So if I send you a deal after two months of you begging me for an off-market deal or begging me for an opportunity and you go radio silent on me, uh, that's a breach of trust. Um, underwrite every deal. It might not be perfect. So what? Submit an offer. Submit an offer based on your underwriting and your criteria, because that's how we build relationship. And I learn what you like. Um, I learn your investment appetite. And that's how a long term relationship is formed, especially for someone new in the market. Yeah, And so it's, it's basically kind of the it is what you're taught at home. Right. You first of all, yeah. you have to you have to be proactive. And then once you're proactive, you need to say what you're going to do and do what you what you said you were going to do. Exactly. And also give feedback. If I present a deal and it's just not for you, it doesn't take long. Matt, I like the submarket. I don't like the unit mix. It has a few too many one bedroom and studios for my taste. Uh, it looks like the owner has tried to stabilize this multiple times and raise rents. He was unsuccessful. I don't know if I'll have any better success with that business plan. That's fine. Just share feedback. That way we both learn and grow together. Yeah. And so one of the things I just I want to highlight for the entire going long family here is because this is really once again, platinum advice that, that Matthew's sharing with us is it's not just about doing those things, but to make giving making sure that you're giving the feedback. Because if especially if you're just getting started and you're looking to buy that first property that's in that 50 to 150 that that, that Matthew's talking about it's not, you don't know what you don't know. And, and Matthew or a very well-established broker doesn't know that you don't know either. So you've got to keep that exchange going and let them know what you like, what you don't like. And maybe that broker is going to be able to also, especially an expert uh, like Matthew is going to be able to give you some feedback. Like, Hey, look, you're looking at these types of properties or you want these types of properties, but they're not really moving in this, in this specific area or in this specific submarket. So um, th this type of dialogue and back and forth is, is something that I think a lot of people don't give. So this is Matthew sharing his additional bits of wisdom so that you can be an even better, more influential investor as you, as you move forward. So I appreciate you sharing that with us, uh, Matthew. Sure. Here's one more thought too. So I had a, yeah. a colleague and a friend that actually in Georgia who uh, was entering into their first apartment deals, about 80 something odd units. And the conversation started and they wouldn't even look at this deal. I wasn't representing um, either side. It was just me being a friend and advisor. They wouldn't even look at this deal at first because they were looking at the in-place cap rate. And they just, you know, they had an expectation of, I'm not going to buy a deal, you know, above, I'm sorry, below a certain cap rate. So, if you have a dialogue with someone like me or a good broker, 
they should be able to articulate value. They should be able to explain why the in-place cap rate is only one you know, snapshot of the deal. What's the upside? What's the opportunity? What's the market occupancy? What's the market uh, average or effective rents? Those are things that once we have a rapport, um, I'd be happy to, to work with you and help you grow into that new space because apartment investing, while it is similar in many ways, there are some nuances uh, compared to, you know, what many of your your audience might be used to, which is, you know, a variety of other investment vehicles. Yeah. And so let's just because I want to make sure we don't leave anybody behind. So when you talk about because I think this is, this is a great exa- way to, to just help add more value, right? Because you're already over delivering on just this one simple question. But when you okay. talk about the in place cap rate, what exactly does that mean? And why is that important for someone who is looking to go out and invest their capital, either actively sure. or passively? Sure. So um, you might have in your mind, I, I want to buy at an eight cap, which in today's market is is pretty rare. Uh, it's just not going to happen, uh, especially in Columbus. Um, right. But if you're only focused on a cap rate, which just was just a, a way to um, measure value based on the net operating income uh, divided by the purchase price. It's one simple formula, one simple ratio. It is not everything because what drives the NOI, that NOI is driven by your income and your operating expenses. So there's a couple of different levers you can pull to increase that NOI. You can raise rents. So for example, if you're looking at an opportunity, uh, it might not look good from a cap rate standpoint, simply because the current in place rents are well below where they should be relative to the marketplace. Um, Occupancy, if you have 100 doors and only 70 are occupied, that occupancy is a variable that can easily shift your bottom line, which is your net operating income. So you can't just look at one piece of data or one metric and say, good deal or bad deal. That's why you really have to dig into, uh, from a holistic standpoint, what is the current state of this opportunity? Um, What could I do to improve the performance of this vehicle? Um, And that could be, it's like running a business. You can save by reducing expenses, you can grow the top line revenue. Um, all those things impact your NOI, which effectively is what most investors are buying off of. Now, if that NOI is just poor today and you have a business plan, and that's a big part of multifamily investment, you have to have a plan when you are analyzing a property up front, when you buy the property, when you own it, and of course, on your exit. So it's a business. It's not a property. You are operating a business and you have to look at it as such. And, and I love the fact that you you helped to break that down, because at the end of the day, once again, it's 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 math equals money. And it is when you want to get the net operating income as strong as possible, you have ultimately two levers, right? To really s- simplify, you either increase revenue or you decrease your operating expenses. And if you can do both of those at the same time, then you're going to actually, you're going to sweeten that, that NOI. Now within the revenue or the expenses, the operating expenses, you have a number of different levers as you talked about, but this is why it's also so important, whether you're an active investor or you're a passive investor, the concepts here that Matthew's sharing with us are really going to help to make you a more informed investor, whether you decide to be passive or, or active once again. So thanks for helping us understand what, what, uh, what you were talking about when you said the, uh, the in ha- the in place, uh, cap rate and then also some of the different levers that it can affect that. Now I'm going to ask you these next questions a little bit out of sequence. But, okay. You know, you're on the going long podcast. <laughs> so we love to be able to invest beyond our backyard. And and I know right. I'd mentioned in the beginning that you have a hyper focus for um for Columbus the M- Columbus MSA and then Central Ohio, right? right? And so I know being an Ohio guy that, that 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 can be two different things or they are two different things, right? So help us understand for those people that are maybe living in in California or they're living in Florida and they're really looking uh, in the Midwest and they're trying to figure out okay this where are some of the places where I could go long myself um right. you talked about Columbus and you talked about Central Ohio so maybe help to contrast those two like when someone's looking for Columbus MSA why are they why are they looking or what are they looking for and when they're looking sure. in the Central Ohio region uh what is that what does that mean for them Sure. So I'll give a couple of different answers because I was going long investing in Ohio when I lived in D.C. Um, so I'll give you a few a few, a few uh, examples. But why do people want to be here in Ohio? Number one. So Columbus is one of the most attractive MSAs for many reasons. Population growth. We are adding 50 people a day to our population. Uh, we're ranked number 14th in the country in terms of the largest uh, MSAs in the entire United States of America. Um, when you look at our economy, Yes, the Ohio State University is here, 
um, but it's quite diverse in terms of meds and eds. Um, highly educated population. Um, we have both your healthcare systems, which is a big part of our economy, but also professional services. So there's a great deal of interest in this market. Um, not to mention, we are 60, we're away um, from 60% of the population, a day's drive. So we are just centrally located, well-located um, market to invest in. So when I think about Columbus, um, it is a hot market. It's a red hot market, like many markets across the country right now. But what was attractive to me uh, going long from D.C. and investing in Ohio was the price point. Um, you know, when I lived in D.C., uh, we had so much invested in just our daily lives, be it where we laid our head, our primary residence, uh, be it the cost of raising two kids. It was just more um, conducive for us to take that capital and invest in Columbus or I should say in Ohio. The first apartment building I bought was in Cleveland, uh, about a 13 unit, my wife and I. Um, that 13 unit in Cleveland, Ohio was equal to a third of the value of my primary residence in DC. So it's attractive from that standpoint alone is that you just can do more and get more for your dollar compared to some other high market or high value markets in the country. Um, that's what's attractive to me. Okay. Well, and I, and I love you, you, you also adding your, your going long story because this is, this is something that's absolutely important. And when you look at, you know, just once again, as an experienced, individual leader who is looking to solve problems for other people. When you talk about a city or, or an area that has job diversification, your meds and your eds, as you like to call them, you look yeah. at net migration, which is positive 50, 50 more people coming into, uh, into the city every single day, uh, on, on net. Um, and then you, you also look to just look at price point in terms of what you can pr purchase per square foot. Um, yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that really makes uh, the the Central Ohio, the Columbus MSA, uh, really really interesting uh, places. So, talking about your 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 going long experience, right? What what were some of the things that you found to be challenging initially? Because it sounds like you were a very active investor, right? Right. Um, talk to us maybe about some of the challenges. Most people don't like to talk about the challenges on uh, doing things long distance. Sure. I mean, a, a lot of challenges. And uh, if you want to ask um, what mistakes not to make, uh, this this might go on for hours, right? Um, <laughs> Especially but, but if, if the two of us have to add that, <laughs> then we'll, go, we'll talk for days. <laughs> sure, sure. So let's just start with, you know, where I started my going long journey, which was in single family. Um, so it's very much um, your success is based on your team and those around you. So having the right team in place, especially boots on the ground when you're going long yeah. is key. Um, that team is someone sourcing the deals. So you can't be there physically to find the opportunity. Uh, you have to have someone there who's bringing those opportunities to you. And of course we're human. So we work off of incentive. So what incentive structure are you also providing to those on your team? Um, and that could be a number of different deal structures. I won't get into all that, but having the right team on the ground from the acquisition side, uh, the GC. So who's going to manage the day-to-day -day operations? I've been fortunate enough to flip properties from DC here in Ohio. I bought them sight unseen. I got YouTube updates from my, my wonderful GC and team. And I've been able to acquire rehab list sale properties without even ever literally seeing them. I have a deal that I've never even seen in real life um, that I made about a 45% return on. So the team is what drives that. It's not me. Uh, it's having a team that's incentivized properly um, on the ground. That's the first step. So love that. And one of the things that we, that I like to, to, to teach as well, right, is, is without a doubt when you're, when you're going along, it is the, the third piece of the puzzle, right? Number one is really being crystal clear on personally what it is that you want a specific uh, opportunity or asset to provide you. Are you looking for tax benefits? Are you looking for cash flow? Are you looking for some type of um, over overall appreciation or, or whatever that may be? And then you go to those locations. Like you talked about, you were in DC, but you knew you were looking for some cash flow. So you went to a market that you knew very well, right? And so you go to the location. And then without right. a doubt, it is fundamental, fundamentally important that the team understand the location and understands what you're trying to do, what you want to achieve, what you talked about in the very couple, first couple minutes of this conversation, because then afterwards, uh, Matthew, and you know this, I mean, afterwards, if, if you know what you want, you're in the right location and the team understands the location and what you want, then whether you put a, a 13 unit apartment complex 
a 200 unit apartment complex, right. a, um, you know, other different things like ATM machines or energy equipment, whatever the case may be, then right. you improve your chances of success. So, absolutely. Um, so, so love the fact that you are in the similar mindset in, in terms of what is the, the way to gain, to get, to, uh, to be successful. Another thing. Yeah, share that, something, uh, something yeah, related. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So back to that 13 unit, um, one of the biggest lessons learned throughout my investment career um, is I limited myself on opportunities based off of what I personally could do with my wife and I's income together. So up until a few years ago, my only partner in business has ever been my wife. Mm -hmm. If we couldn't personally guarantee that loan, if we couldn't qualify, if we didn't have enough cash to buy that deal, I was boxed out and we didn't do it. That was a huge mistake. So looking back on it, um, not only is team important, but being willing to find the right partnerships um, earlier in my investment career would have been uh, a major blessing and given me even more success. Um, so that 13 unit, I learned a, a tough lesson with 13 doors. If you have two or three vacancies and you have one or two non-payers, you ain't cash flowing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so my biggest lesson learned is that I had to go bigger and I had to yeah. think bigger and I had to partner with folks who are doing it on a bigger level. Yeah. And, th and this is one of the things that most of us, we, we, when we start and we have those positive experiences and we realize that we want to continue down this track, that's one of the things that we see is that I, I like to say all the time, hashtag teamwork makes the dream work. Like you'll see right. it all over because, because it really is. And when you're able to, to sometimes you may be, you may have to be asked to relinquish some control. Right. And as long as you are working with the right team, then the re returns should be commensurate. And I don't just mean financial returns. I mean, it returns in terms of being able to uh, build relationships, in terms of being able to travel to places that you want to be able to do, in terms of being able to ex have the experiences that you want. And of course, if there's the financial return that you were expecting or above, then, hey, look, it's all gravy at that point. So sure. um, so I think it makes it, it it's it's a great way to think about it. And, you know, it's because we take these little steps, but always progressing forward, we realize, well, you know what, this 13 unit, I, I learned some things, but you know what, Matthew, it makes you and it makes everybody that you're sharing your story with going to be even better investors. And that goes back to being part of a community. Sure. So, so thanks for sharing that. So what do you think that, um, and, and I'm asking you to put your, your problem solver cap on again. Okay. Uh, so you're also talking to a lot of, uh, investors, right? A lot of investors will come out to you and they want to do this and they want to do that. But you've probably, well, and I'm sure in your experience, you've seen this. What are like, what are some of the, maybe if you could think of one or two things that investors, when they are looking to go out and be achieve success, right? In a specific location, what are the things that you see that are common misses that they're just not doing properly? And if they just change this one or two things, it's going to exponentially in, improve their chances of success. Sure. Um, well, a partnership is one, right? So there's a lot of great teams out there uh, who can take a lot of the guesswork for, for some new investors out of the equation. Uh, so finding the right partnership is, is first and foremost. Um, I would say being unwilling to pivot. And mm -hmm. I fall into that category and I've made that mistake where Tell I got to- Tell more about that one. Yeah, I definitely want to hear about yeah. this. Tell us more about this. Sure. So let me take the multifamily um, brokerage component out of it. I'll just speak for, from my own experience. Um, I got back to Ohio and I immediately wanted to start rebuilding my local portfolio of real estate. Um, so I don't invest in apartment buildings in my market because I see that as being a conflict of interest with my clients. I serve my clients. I don't want to be competition to my clients. So when I hit the ground, I said, all right, how do I, you know, get active as an investor here in my hometown and in my market? And, you know, the easiest path for a lot of people is, you know, partnering with someone who is doing large apartment deals. That's that's not a, a difficult task, but I wanted to be a little more active and hands on. So I wanted to start rehabbing and getting back to flipping properties, which I've, I've done a fair amount, not a whole lot, but a fair amount over the years. And I just couldn't find deals. I was getting beat out. The market was hot. Every deal that I pens that, that I underwrote that sized up would be 20 plus offers. I'm a disciplined investor, so I didn't stretch into opportunities that didn't make sense. So I had to learn how to pivot. And for me, instead of buying existing improved real estate, my mind got consumed with this thing called land. And uh, there happens to be a lot of land that a lot of people aren't looking at right now. And, um, you know, if you read the news, you just follow certain thought leaders, Bill Gates, 
he likes his land. And um, instead of me going after improved uh, real estate, cash flow driven real estate, I just started looking at land and just saying, all right, does this deal make sense? Can I buy this land? And most oftentimes, it's less competitive. It's not a bidding war. There's fewer people looking for just land than they are looking for improved real estate. So for me, that was a pivot. Um, I pivoted into buying lots. You know, since I got back to Ohio, I've purchased 26 lots, vacant lots, um, with no immediate plan to build, but knowing that there is a scarcity to that to that um, commodity of land. Um, so that's my personal story of how I pivoted and had to get out of my own way when I was laser focused on buying cash flowing real estate or income producing real estate. So, and, and I love that, um, Matthew, and I'm going to ask you to expand on that a little bit. And, and, and just to also share, I mean, that was one of the things that happened to me. You know, I wanted to buy real estate, multifamily, multifamily real estate, and I was doing that for a while. And then, um, then I ended up buying a mobile home park and although that's multifamily on a different scale, and then I started getting into other types of assets, right? And, and yep. all of a sudden I was like, oh, hang on a second. Well, these ATM things, they, these look really cool. And then um, th- this energy equipment, I know I mentioned it before, but having this ability to pivot right. um, as long as it ties back into what we talked about in the beginning, which is what is it personally that your philosophy is? What are you hoping to gain out of this? Um and then you go to the location and then you, once you're there, the team can help right. you. Uh, and then, then it goes into the specific opportunity, but coming back to this land thing, cause I think this is lovely. And I want uh. you to tie, help us understand, cause there's also another L word that is really, really close to your heart and that's yeah. a legacy. Yes. And so help us understand where maybe this pivot with land is also helping you to tie into your desire for building legacy. Sure. That's a great question. Um, and I have two small boys, uh, Maxwell and Jackson. Maxwell is six, uh, soon to be seven. And Jackson just turned four. And being back in Ohio, we're city guys. We're city people. Um, we wanted somewhere that we could just stretch our legs, have a little bit of room to run around. So we identified uh, a site about an hour and 15 minutes outside of Columbus. Uh, and we bought 28 acres. And on those 28 acres, we're going to build uh, multiple cabins. And it started out by just wanting a place in the woods for my boys to be able to go and play. But then when you looked at the market opportunity, and again, this is just me pivoting short-term rentals, Airbnbs in rural locations, but close proximity to major markets. You know, my site is an hour and 15 from Columbus, uh, two hours from Pittsburgh, uh, about two and a half hours from Cleveland. It just made sense to turn this more into a legacy project and a passion project. Mm -hmm. Short-term benefit is obviously cash flow. Long-term benefit is I'm doing this with my family. I'm showing them um, a business and I have a business plan. And this should be a cash flow stream uh, that continues well beyond my years. Uh, And if they want to keep that property in the family uh, beyond my lifetime, which is my hope, uh, I think not only did I show them how to build something, but I also showed them what vision looks like and how to execute a vision. And we did it together. Um, so, so that is, uh, that is exactly what I'm working on right now. Okay. So I love that man. And, and being able to have that clarity of vision and, and being able to drive towards that. Now, one of the things that, I, and I, I like being able to, to discuss this because you are very successful. Uh, you have been very successful, not only in your, your undergraduate, uh, in your MBA, uh, then you went into industry and, and you have been able to be successful, be a high achiever, build teams. Uh, you love being a, a husband. You love being a father. And there's a lot of balls that are in the air. Right. right. And, and I right. didn't used to talk about this a lot, but it's one of the things that I, you know, even though I do a lot of things, I feel like I'm still like there's just so many balls in the air that I'm there. I feel like I'm struggling to do so many things pr- right. properly. Maybe talk to us about what are some of the things that you have either been challenged by in terms of being able to do everything well. Or, um, or may, or how you find the right balance to be able right. to do things well. Maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Right. Uh, I know balance is a, a buzzword that people like to use a lot. I, I think it's difficult to achieve balance. It's just it's, it's difficult. So I just focus on prioritization. There are only a few hours of the day where both my kids and I are awake, right? I mean, uh, I, I wake up early. I wake up around 5.30. My kids wake up at 7.30. They're out the door to go to school by 8.30. So that's literally one hour in the morning that they're here. Um, 
I intentionally make it a point to every single day I pick them up from school. So the first part of my business day uh, is from 8.30 to about 2.30. Um, I have to break, and I did not do this when I was managing 65 brokers in DC. Um, I now have the privilege to set my schedule because I make it a priority. So from 2.30 to about four o'clock, I'm with my boys. We have help. Uh, we have a nanny and a, and a tutor that comes over at four o'clock. She's here from four to seven. And then at seven o'clock, we have dinner. So really, when you think about it, on a daily basis, I only have about four to five hours with my boys when we're both awake. So that's still 19, 20 hours left in the day for me to do whatever else I need to do. So there's no reason that I cannot prioritize four hours out of the day to spend with my family, uh, knowing that I have at least 19 or 20 to be able to sleep and execute on whatever vision I have. So when you break it down to the actionable, and I believe strongly in controlling the controllables, you can't control a lot of things. I can control how I spend those three, four or five hours with my family every single day. That's something that I can control hands down. Um, so prioritizing that over a spreadsheet, over a phone call, um, everyone else has to just f find another time, find another window on my calendar. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I love that. And in that focus, um, I just read a book not too long ago, free to focus in it. And the real, the whole thing around that is about, I think it's Michael Hyatt wrote the book. Um, and it's really about prioritization. So I love how you, really look at that, not in terms of balance, but in terms of prioritization. So sure. um, listen, Matthew, man, before we get to the going long final three, because we okay. got to get there, uh -huh. uh, I would love for you to share with us kind of what is the what's the future look like, man? I mean, you've done so many things. You've made so much pro positive progress. Um, share with us so that we can kind of have an idea of your vision of, of what things look like uh, for you and how you're solving problems for others uh, in the next, let's say 12 to 18 months. Sure. Um, hopefully the future looks healthy. Uh, I think we've all grown, um, you know, to, to appreciate good health these past couple of months. Um, I hope that the future brings, I want to say not peace, um, but a sense of, um, of calm in my life. A lot of my early years out of college were quite stressful. I was on that, that wheel. I was on the treadmill. And um, right now, I'm just growing comfortable with saying no to certain things. Um, and, I, and I hope that through a more focused approach to life, both business and personal, uh, I just have uh, a spirit of peace um, and just comfort knowing that if I execute on my business plan, there will be income. Uh, we, we need income to be able to do the things that we enjoy doing. Um, but in turn, I have a, a new mindset in terms of how I get to that income and what that can do for me and my family. So I'll, in the next 12 to 18 months, I envision uh, fully having these 28 acres up and, uh, and operating. Uh, I envision acquiring um, more passive streams of income. I didn't know what mortgage note investing was up until about 12 months ago. Uh, I've acquired some assets. They're the best cash flowing deals I've ever done. And um, they're much more passive than some of my more active multifamily properties. So uh, I just want to shift more toward legacy projects and more toward truly passive opportunities uh, that create that cash flow that I'm seeking. Okay. Love that, man. So ultimately, you're once again clear on what it is that you want to be able to do. And, and having that clarity of vision is going to help, I'm sure, you to achieve what you want to be able to achieve in the next 12 to 18 months. So um, listen, man, I, I want to keep kind of talking, but we got to get to the going long final three, of course. And okay. so the thing is, I never ask anybody of the going long final three unless they tell me that you're they're ready to answer. So are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. I knew you would be, man. You were born ready. <laughs> so, uh, so listen, so we started on your side of the pond and now we're going to bring it back to the uh, back to Europe. So I'd love yeah. to know, uh, Matthew, what is the your well, what is your favorite European city either that you visited and I know you're very well traveled uh, or is still on your bucket list to visit? Uh, you know, it's, it is a tough one. I'll say Amsterdam, Amsterdam, uh, because I traveled there for the first time in about 2008. And uh, I was there with my fiance then soon to be wife. And uh, I got to tell you, going through the red light district with your wife, that is a test. Uh, and uh, just doing certain things in the city. I love riding on the bicycles. Um, it was a phenomenal experience. And uh, the Heineken is so crisp. It's just like, it's like water. Yeah, yeah. So 
<laughs> All right. So we got another vote for Amsterdam. Yeah. Um, you have to tell me about that, that walk. Uh, so yes. anyway, we'll, we'll yeah. talk about that offline. Um, yep. so, so listen, so the, <laughs> the other thing is, um, you know, Matthew, you are someone who is, and I talked about it before you, you have achieved an enormous levels uh, of success. And, and, and one of the things I always notice about extremely successful people is that along their trajectory, they've only made like one mistake the entire time, which is what, oh, okay. I, I, I always get that wrong. Sorry. Um, sure. no, <laughs> ma- ma- maybe the thing about really successful people is in spite of many learning opportunities or mistakes or however you want to call them. What I found is that, the really successful t- people take away the lesson. And yeah. so if you can think of just one lesson that would really make a huge impact on the entire going long family, what would that one lesson be that you would pay forward to, uh, to the going long family? Wow. So, so going back, um, looking back over my career and just personal experiences, don't be so quick to sell. I mean, be patient and it's hard to, to think about that now, but if you really want to make yourself mad, go back and look at, you know, the first couple of properties that you bought in, in your in your lifetime, in your career and kind of see what they're worth today. Um, I was so quick to sell and make a profit in my early years that um, I wasn't thinking uh, with the long game in mind. And if I could go back and do it again, I would definitely have sold less frequently and had a primary intent to hold longer term. So that's my, again, pivot. Uh, Now I'm 38. Uh, My pivot now is if I'm buying something, I have the intent to hold it uh, at at least uh, through when my children are in college, if not longer. So that's, that's my, my mistake and my lesson learned. All right. Fantastic. So be patient and, uh, and let, let time be on your side. So um, I think that that is fantastic. And then we're just going to wrap things up, Matthew, with helping us to understand. I always love to feed the brain before we go. So help and share. And I know you love reading as well. So what is one book that you would recommend to the Going Along family? Sure. Actually, uh, I brought it here. Oh, uh, cool. so, it's on my watch, desk. so you got to check out the video version, everybody. Check out the video version. <laughs> so um, Richest Man Who Ever Lived, uh, King Solomon's Secrets to Success, Wealth and Happiness. I love this book because when you read it, it does remind you of the richest man in Babylon, which just has several jewels and gems. Um, but this book is also based on King Solomon's just wisdom. And, um, you know, he's the richest man that ever lived and the wisest. And um, I think the lessons learned apply to business, but also personal life. So that's what I'm reading right now. I'm about halfway through and I love it. All right. Fantastic. So the richest man who ever lived. And we're going to include all of these things in the show notes, uh, which is fantastic. And, you know, Matthew, I'm just, I, I can't, I, I, like these conversations go by so fast and I'm just <laughs> like, I just want to keep talking to you forever and ever. And so I'm just thinking about from the very me- beginning that you talked to us and started sharing with us back in 2007, um, you know, you being, and well, the influence that you saw from your father, right? Just in this whole real estate game and the construction part of things. And then you putting your hand up at 24 years old and saying 2009, you're going to go to Baghdad and you were there right. and you spent nine months and was just something that really also helped to, to change the trajectory of what you wanted to be able to do, right? Your, your pivot and realizing that you wanted to be able to broker relationships. And, and then you were able to get into that uh, space. You're able to do uh, tens of millions of dollars and, and, and large sales teams and, you know, up to the point where you have $400 million in transactions, which is just phenomenal. And then I think back to the things that you're sharing with us now, which is really understanding about how you want to continue to solve problems for others. You're focused on serving others. Uh, right. You are focused on also really continuing to be the best father you can be, the best husband you can be, and also creating legacy. And so all of these things, man, I am sure like, 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 you know, I personally love just talking to you all the time. And I know other people I, I in the too. Long family You're are awesome, like, man. I got to get in touch with Matthew. How do I find out more? How can I pick up the sure. phone and talk to this guy? So help us understand what is the best way for the going long family to contact you, get to be in touch with you and know more about you. Sure. So LinkedIn is my, my largest platform. Um, you can find me obviously by searching my name, Matthew, last name spelled D R A N E. And, um, secondly, I would say Instagram. Um, I'm newer to that platform, but I, I like to document a lot of the things that we just described and you'll see, you know, my family, you'll see some of the things that we mentioned here today. So M is in Matthew drain D R A N E. 1911 M drain 1911 on Instagram. And you'll see various links. I have a link tree bio there that has 
all my different ways to contact me. So it's the best place to get all my info in one place. All right. Fantastic. So mdrain 1911 and right. also on the, uh, on the LinkedIn platform and, and going along family, I'm going to ask you all one thing, right? When you reach out to Matthew and um, let him know that you heard him here as part of the going along family conversation with me, because that's one of the ways it really will help Matthew understand, like you're listening, he's already added some value to your life. And it's just a great way for the two of you to continue that conversation, continue the connection. So that's my personal ask. And, um, and listen, Matthew, I appreciate you so much, man. Uh, continue to go out, continue to keep on making things happen, keep things positive. Um, and really, really want to say thank you for investing your time and energy with me and the entire going along family today, man. Billy, it's been awesome. And before I go, I have to tell you, thank you. Um, I really do respect you, admire you, and it's been an honor to be on your show. Uh, so thanks for having me. All right, man. It's my, my pleasure. My pleasure. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, Matthew, if you give me just a couple seconds, I just want to say a couple words to the Going Long family. Um, listen, once again, uh, Matthew brought so much uh, actionable insight today, he shared his stories, his experiences, his legacy, and, and the things that he's going to continue to do. And he's given it and made a really easy way for you to get in touch with him. So I'm going to recommend that each and every one of you do that today. Um, and I want to say thank you for investing your time with Matthew and I. Um, and, and through the conversation today, you know, you have the opportunity to make a positive impact on someone else's life. So share today's episode with like two or three other people. You're being that person that's that's helping them. And you're also attracting more people to our community as being a part of the, the going long family. Uh, and with that, let Matthew and I know what you thought about today's conversation. Like, leave us an honest review of the conversation. I know that's something that I take very seriously. I read through every single time. I take your recommendations, your suggestions to continue to make this podcast and video cast better and better and more value add for each and every one of you. So just take a couple of seconds, leave an honest review. Really, really appreciate that. And you know what? I'm really looking forward to welcoming you back on the very next conversation. And until then, go out and make it a great day. And thank you very much. Wow. Don't you love hearing from top notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode. So go out and make it a great day.